Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the Federalist Papers that you need to know about. So first, to understand the Federalist Papers, you should remember from earlier in the year, difference between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Federalists wanted a stronger national government and they wanted the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists did not want the Constitution. So the Federalist Papers were written in order to argue why the state of New York explicitly should ratify the Constitution. Federalist Papers were written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. You should remember those three names. You do not need to know for each individual Federalist Paper who wrote that paper. I'm not really interested in that. But you should know that the Federalist Papers were written by these three people, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. So the first one we're going to talk about is Federalist Paper 10. Federalist Paper 10 deals with the issue of factions. Factions are small groups of people who are united around some common interest, and they want the government to support their interest, even if it goes against other groups' interests. They don't really care about other groups, they care about their group. So, examples of modern factions would be like citrus growers here in Central Florida. Because of citrus growers, there is a tariff or a tax on all orange juice imported into the United States. Brazilians can make orange juice cheaper than Americans, so Brazilian orange juice is cheaper. That would be bad for American citrus growers because people would stop buying their oranges. So they pushed for the government to create a tax on imported orange juice. This is an example of a faction. They have an interest, their business, and it goes against your interest because every single American who buys orange juice pays more for orange juice because of this tariff. So they worked against your interest. Uh, Cuban Americans would be an example. Because of Cuban Americans representing a faction in South Florida, they've lobbied the government for a very different treatment of Cuba than we have of other countries. We freely trade with China, which is communist. We freely trade with Vietnam, which is communist. Uh, but we do not freely trade with Cuba. Why? Because Cuban Americans have lobbied for an embargo and different treatment of that. Our immigration laws are very different for Cuba. If people from other countries are able to cross the border illegally and get into the United States, if we detect them, we generally will send them back with some exceptions, okay? But Cubans, if Cubans, you might know often, will get on boats, rafts, things like that, come across the water and get to land. Our laws for Cubans are if they touch land, they get to stay here. If they get caught in the water, they get sent back to Cuba. This is the only country we do that with. The only country where if you get to America, you're safe, is Cuba because of the Cuban American faction. We can think of like factions that could exist in Polk County or here in Lakeland. You might have a lifted diesel truck owner faction. What do they want? Well, they want things like off-road diesel fuel to be legal. They want things like diesel fuel taxes to be lower. Okay, they want certain things. But then you might have hipsters over in Dixieland. What do they want? They want like subsidies or government paying for their electric bicycles or something like that. Okay? So these different groups have their different issues. That's the topic of Federalist 10. How do we deal with factions? According to Federalist 10, a larger nation will be better able to handle the issue of factions because there'll be so many different factions across the country that no one faction will be able to get too much power. Whereas in a local area, you know, maybe one group is able to get more power and just run over the other groups. But in a large government, that's not possible. So each one of these factions will have to negotiate and compromise with other groups in order to get what they want. So that was the argument of Federalist Paper 10, is that a larger government will actually be better by reducing the power of individual factions. Then we get into Federalist Paper 39. So the question, the criticism that the Anti-Federalists had was that the Constitution was neither Republican nor federal. So they have to answer this question. Is the Constitution Republican and is it federal? Now first we need to know what does Republican mean in this case because today usually when we talk about Republican we mean like the GOP, the Republican Party, as opposed to the Democratic Party. But in this case, we're talking about Republican systems of government. What does that mean? It means that the government is made up of representatives of the people. The government represents the people. So the anti-federalists argued 
that the ancient Greek city-states, those were like the real Republican systems, uh, the Roman Republic, uh, those were the real Republican systems and they had to be small local governments. But they argued that the nation would be too big and couldn't truly represent the people. So the Federalists, in writing Federalist 39, had to explain how it could be both Republican and Federalist. They said, we do vote for our representatives. So that makes it a Republican government. And they argued that the Senate represented the states, which made it a federal government. Of course, obviously, the national government and the state governments had their divided powers, the federal system. But in this case, they're going to explicitly argue that the Senate makes it a federal system because the Senate was built, designed to represent the states. So let's talk about that. Uh, the criticism, again, that they were addressing, another criticism was that politicians would be too separated in a national government. They wouldn't truly represent the people because they're way over in Washington, D.C. So their response in Federalist 39 is that the House, House of Representatives, is directly elected by the people. And they actually go through and explain and compare to different states and say all the states in the country at that point also represent uh, had a House of Representatives and was elected by the people. So they say the U.S. House of Representatives isn't really any different than what states are doing. So if you're going to argue that the House of Representatives is not Republican, then you're also going to have to say that every state is not Republican. So they make that comparison. Then they go into the Senate and they say the Senate is indirectly elected. It's true that in the first system, the way the Constitution was written, people did not elect their senators. But instead, the senators were elected by the state legislatures, who were elected by the people. So the people elected their representatives at their state capital, and then those representatives elected the senators. So they said it's indirect, but it's still based on the people. So uh, they argued that it's indirect just like the current Articles of Confederation that they were trying to replace, the Congress there was done the same way, and they point out the Senate of Maryland was elected the same way. Um, so they say again, you know, unless you're going to say Maryland isn't really a good system, then you can't say the Constitution isn't a good system. They get into the length of terms uh, for each elected person, and they again try to make a comparison to the states that already existed, and they said, the length of office for each elected person is pretty similar. The House members are represented are elected to represent for two years, just like in all the states. So again, same thing. The Senate, according to our Constitution, senators are elected for six years, which is longer than the states. But they point out it's only one year longer than the Senate of Maryland. Uh, then they go into the president. And they say the president is elected for four years, which is longer than many of the state governors. But, unlike some of the states, the president can be impeached. So they say that actually keeps the president a little more accountable and everything. So even though the president's elected longer than some of the governors, uh, they're still elected and they can be impeached, so that keeps them accountable. Then they go into judges. So we've talked about the legislature and the executive branch. Now they get into the third branch, judges. And they say that even judges are indirectly chosen by the people because uh, federal judges are nominated by the president and then confirmed by the Senate, and the president and the Senate are representative of the people, so even judges are representing the people. Now, they do point out that the judges are not directly chosen by the people, but it is indirect, so you have that. The House, the Senate, the president, and judges are all chosen either directly or indirectly by the people, so it is a Republican system. The government represents the people. Another criticism that they're addressing, the government is going to concentrate too much power in one place, the national government, or particularly certain branches. So they say the House gets its power directly from representing the people, so that's not too much power. The Senate is getting its power indirectly through the states. The House makes the Constitution national government, Republican, because the House is representing the people, and the Senate is making the Constitution Federalist, representing the states. So neither the people nor the states have too much power. The states have some power in the Senate, the people have some power in the House of Representatives, but it's kind of balanced, and of course the states still have their power in the federal system, 
even in the national system, the states have their power because they're represented by the Senate. So there's a good balance overall, is what they're trying to say. The Constitution has a good balance between national power, which needed to happen because we had to fix the Articles of Confederation, but also still restrains the, the federal government in a lot of ways, keeping power at the state level as well. So there's a balance. One quick little side note is some of this changes with the 17th Amendment. That's when senators started being elected by the people, so now we vote on our senators instead of Tallahassee choosing our senators. So that actually takes away the state representation in uh, Washington, D.C., so that's a change. Uh, but originally, senators were chosen by the state legislatures. Now we vote on our senators. Finally, Federalist Paper 51. It was written to explain how separation of powers with checks and balances will protect the liberty of American people. They borrowed a lot of ideas from Montesquieu, who you remember, a French philosopher who wrote about separation of powers. According to Montesquieu, a good government will have three branches, each with divided powers. The legislative will make laws, the executive will enforce the laws, and the judicial will interpret the laws. And that's the exact same system we have, straight from Montesquieu. Uh, each branch of government would be largely independent, according to Montesquieu and Federalist 51. Members of each branch would have little power to select or control the members of the other branches. So the president doesn't select representatives. The representatives don't select the president. Um, there is an exception, though, that the president and the Senate work together to select judges. They note that that does give the president and the Senate some power in appointing judges, but they say that's necessary because judges need certain qualifications and we need people who can assess those qualifications. But they point out that once a judge is appointed to the federal courts, that judge has something called lifetime tenure, which means they have that job for the rest of their life unless they get impeached or retire or die. <clears throat> so once they get on the federal courts, they're independent. One of the arguments in Federalist 51 is that you need com competing ambitions. So each branch is going to want its branch to have more power. So it's going to be fighting for power. But the other branches are going to be fighting for power too. And this competing ambition is going to keep any of them from gaining power. Each branch wants to increase their power, but is being restrained by the other two branches. And in the Federalist 51, uh, the author actually argues that if men were angels, we wouldn't even need government at all. We know men aren't angels. We know that they want their power and they want to do uh, whatever they want. So you have them compete with each other in order to restrain those bad tendencies. So the challenge addressed by Federalist 51 is how do we make a government that's strong enough to control the people, that's what government exists for, but the government is still created by the people, and accountable to the people. There's principles of the Declaration of Independence. People create the governments, and the governments get their power from the people. How do we balance those things? Federalist 51 says representative government is necessary. Government would then be accountable to the people, but we also have checks and balances within that to keep uh, the government from abusing its power. They go into military power as an example as well. Military power is even divided. The military obviously exists, but it's led by the president, who is a civilian. And then even then, there's another division. Congress is the one who declares war and funds the military. So the military can't do anything without money, and it gets its money from Congress. The military obeys the commands of the commander-in-chief, the president. Okay, so you have this division here. Treaties and ambassadors. The president can negotiate treaties and nominate ambassadors but the Senate has to approve them. So again, power is divided there. The legislative branch, according to the Constitution and the Federalists, was the most powerful of the branches, so then they even divided that further. So the legislative branch is divided into two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So it's further divided in order to keep it from becoming too powerful. And that's it, that's Federalists 10, 39, and 51.